Hello, Montana, and hello, world. I'm Chris Hislop from the Montana World Affairs Council, and this is Connect Montana, where we bring the world to Montana and Montana to the world. We're continuing our spring series, talking about Asia, nationalism, restorative justice, immigration, and a host of other issues that matter to Montana and to Montanans. If you missed any of our previous 66 episodes, you can see them on our YouTube channel. Of course, all of these webcasts come to you thanks to the very generous support of our sponsors at the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, Stockman Bank, and Allegiance. Tonight, we're joined by our special partners at the Western Montana Military Officers Association. Since 1972, the WMMOA has been a chapter of the Military Officers Association of America. The Western Montana Military Officers Association is an autonomous and self-supporting organization dedicated to serving the interests of all active, former, and retired Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, Coast Guard, and Public Health Service, National Guard, and Reserve members, their spouses, and survivors. It's not only a military, but a community and nationally focused organization. Many thanks for joining us tonight. I'll introduce our guest, General Wesley Clark, shortly. And General Clark will speak for about 15 minutes, and this will be followed by a question and answer period where you, the participants, can ask questions. We'll use the chat function in Zoom, and if you're not familiar with that, you can scroll your mouse, uh, and on the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a small icon of a speech bubble. If you click that on the right-hand part of your screen, the chat box will open, and on the bottom of that is a text field that you can type in your questions. I will curate those questions, and I'll choose the questions that are in keeping with our nonpartisan character and relevant to tonight's topic. My colleague Julie will also chat in some messages. I think she's already done so, so you might want to keep that chat box open. She'll also ask you if you'd like to receive an email with a follow-up message from tonight's event. Now let me introduce tonight's guest. General Wesley Clark serves as chairman and CEO of Wesley K. Clark and Associates, a strategic consulting firm, chairman and founder of Envera Incorporated, a licensed investment bank, and chairman of Energy Security Partners, LLC, as well as serving on numerous corporate boards, including BNK Petroleum and Lee Gold Mining. In the not-for-profit space, he's a senior fellow at UCLA's Berkel Center for International Relations, Director of the Atlantic Council and founding chair of the City Year Little Rock, North Little Rock. A best selling author, General Clark has written four books and is a frequent contributor on TV and in newspapers. General Clark retired as a four star general after 38 years in the United States Army, having served in his last assignments as commander of US Southern Command and then as commander of US European Command, Supreme Allied Commander Europe. He graduated first in his class at West Point and completed degrees in philosophy, politics, and economics at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar. His awards include the Presidential Medal of Freedom, Defense Distinguished Service Medal, Silver Star, Bronze Star, Purple Heart, and honorary knighthoods from the British and Dutch governments. He's also been awarded the Department of State Distinguished Service Award and numerous honorary doctorates and civilian honors. Welcome, General Clark. It's a real honor and a privilege to have you on tonight. How are you? Chris, I'm good, and thank you very much. It's uh, great to be with the Montana World Affairs Council and the Western Montana Military Officers Association, and thanks for this opportunity. And a special shout out to all the current and veteran military guys and gals out there. And uh, let me just say, you know, you've heard it before, but Thank God for your service. That's all I can say because the country depends on the men and women who serve in uniform in ways you just can't imagine. We're so fortunate in America that people are willing to serve and put their lives on the line. Well, um, tonight um, I'm here representing the Renew America Together organization. It's a 501c3 not-for-profit. We put it together to try to bring a, a, a better communication across the partisan divide in America. You can't have an American foreign policy that's successful 
if you have a divided America where our allies don't know which is what's going to happen when the next administration takes over. So um, it's not only about domestic politics, it's about our foreign policy. So we've been reaching out uh, for numerous um, uh, speeches and, and programs, universities and foreign affairs, world affairs councils across the country for the last couple of years with uh, Republicans. I like to say it's post-partisan, but I, I discovered there's, you can be a retired military, but there's never retirement when you've been in partisan politics. You just remain engaged. The thing is, most people don't understand it. And we've recently created a Civility Leadership Institute to be able to bring people together to actually learn about how to talk across the partisan divide. It's getting increasingly difficult because there are organizations that promote the divide. They benefit from it. And uh, they want to turn one group against another group, raise money from it and, and profit from it and in various ways. And so uh, it undercuts really what we're trying to do in foreign policy. And, and, and I want to just say this on foreign policy. I, I retired from the military in 2000. Um, wasn't my choice, but that's what happens. They say, uh, Clark, time to go. So uh, I went, had the big parade at Fort Myer, got the last medals and also my bunch of classmates there from West Point and friends from Little Rock and people I'd served with. And it's a wonderful day, uh, but then it's over. And so when 9-11 happened, I was uh, in enormous pain that our country had been attacked. I wasn't in uniform. I couldn't do a thing about it other than comment on it on CNN. But it quickly became apparent to me that it wasn't enough for the United States public to go into Afghanistan. We went in there. Uh, we had to, really. We should have taken out Osama bin Laden, but we went in without a plan. It was like, you know, what we used to joke in the military was ready, fire, aim. So we jumped into Afghanistan with some special forces guys. They were real heroes. They knocked the Taliban government out. And everybody said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What about Osama bin Laden? He's a guy that did it. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, we should get Osama bin Laden. But there was never a plan. He escaped over the mountains into Pakistan and was supported there and hidden there. The United States stayed on in Afghanistan, but our attention turned to Iraq. And here, you know, the guys that com commanded that, I knew them all. Most of them worked for me at one point. I knew their families, their company, when they were company commanders, battalion commanders for me, I knew their children and, um, and I wished them the best, but I also knew it was the wrong mission. And um, sure enough, uh, it's turned out to be a strategic disaster. Uh, one of the greatest strategic mistakes America's ever made in our 200 and almost 50 year history. While we were in Iraq and then later dealing with ISIS and dealing with Syria and the chaos and the refugee crisis, China was moving ahead economically and they were moving into their fourth modernization. It was set up in a program in the late 1970s by Deng Xiaoping who took over after Mao Zedong died. And Deng said, there's no difference between a black cat and a white cat, they both catch mice. So with that saying, he unleashed the power of free markets, relatively free markets in China, starting with agriculture, then moving on to business. And the Chinese economy took off. There were four modernizations, agriculture, industry, technology, and the fourth modernization was the military. I made a couple of trips over when I was still in uniform. I witnessed the Chinese, met with the Chinese military, got to know them, followed their progress. And suddenly, maybe 15 years ago, they put the pedal to the metal and they took off. And what happened is with the United States engaged in Iraq. And then the Great Recession of 2008, where the stock market tumbled and people panicked and people lost their jobs and everybody said, oh my God, capitalism, it's not working that well. China put forth a big economic program, built thousands of kilometers of high-speed rail and dumped money into their armed forces. 
And by, by the end of next year, they'll have four aircraft carriers, the largest Navy in the world, nuclear submarines, nuclear missiles, the ability to take on our aircraft carriers, a counter space program, an area uh, denial, access denial, area denial program that will really, uh, it aims to push us out of the Western Pacific and shatter our long-term relationships with countries like Japan and South Korea. It's a typical um, Chinese long-term, steady, steady, inexorable push and advance, powered by a growing economy. Chinese economy grew last quarter 18% by their figures. And um, they claim they conquered COVID. Don't think that's exactly true, but that's their claim. And where we are right now in the world is we have two alternative models of civilization. There's the American model, human rights, democracy, voting. We believe that somehow there's magic in people's choices that, that even though people aren't necessarily experts on all the issues, that when you balance it all out and you get the, the experts and the not experts and the people who are interested and the people who aren't and they all weigh in on it, Somehow there's a sort of magic. Um, Rousseau, <laughs> the French philosopher in the 18th century coined a term called the general will. But it's not the general will, it's just somehow that it's common sense, America. And well, Winston Churchill said, America will always do the right thing after it's tried every other thing. So we believe in this magic spirit of democracy. China has the other model. They believe you take the smartest people proven through exams and competitive um, uh, advancement through various echelons. It's a Mandarin system. They've had it before, but now it's guided by the Communist Party. And for those of you who've been in the military, and if you know anything about PERSCOM or what we used to call mil percent in the army where you had an assignment manager, that's the way the Communist Party works. You start out as a young person, you're given a like deputy mayor of a small village. If you prove yourself, you move up. It's a meritocracy. Now there's a lot of things about China we don't like, but you can't argue with performance. And so this is the alternative model, not freedom, but prosperity, uh, greater middle class in China than the entire population of the United States. So um, they're, caught up with this in most of our technologies right now, maybe ahead of us in AI, maybe ahead of us in quantum computing. And um, they can, um, they, they want to get to the moon before we do and put a moon base up there. China and Russia are working to build a space station together. So this is an alternative model for mankind. And it's animated by their resentment of us. They say we push too hard. They say we're trying to destroy their civilization with democracy. They say the greatest threat to China is Western democratic values. Now, in the middle of this, between the United States and China, there's Russia. Russia is a spoiler. Vladimir Putin's a scavenger. He takes what he can get. He, he, okay, Barack Obama was right. Russia's a, you know, it's a second-rate economy. It's an oil exporter. That's it but they've got a first class military technology base. <laughs> they are a major nuclear power and they have a premier strategist in Vladimir Putin. He runs a mafia state. So he has organized crime and he has the intelligence organizations, a wealthy man, probably the wealthiest man in the world, that's what people say, but he never misses a beat when it comes to pushing to reestablish Russia's role in world affairs. He wants to be out there and consult it. He wants to reestablish the so-called Soviet space, take back Ukraine, take back Belarus, Georgia. Yeah, they should uh, be part of the new Russia as well. Um, he's, um, he wants the um, Western allies out of Eastern Europe. Um, he's still got a toehold in the Balkans in Serbia. He's pushing Serbia, NATO does an exercise and Serbia does a countervailing exercise with Russian support. So uh, we've got an adversary there. Is there gonna be war in Ukraine? Probably not. 
uh, but he's got the forces, maybe 110,000. Um, and when we look at Russian forces, we don't look at them the same way American forces, because these are Russian forces without logistics. You got 110,000 troops there with maybe another 50,000 logisticians you don't see behind. So uh, this is a big, big buildup against Ukraine. Ukraine knows it. They've counter-mobilized to some degree. They're fearful of what could happen. Um, and it's a flashpoint. So the Biden administration's facing a flashpoint in Ukraine. They're facing a problem with China that's a chronic problem, but it could come to a sharp point over Taiwan. And you've still got the challenges of the Middle East, and terrorism, um, Iran, nuclear weapons, um, and, um, and the southern border with immigrants, refugees coming in to the United States. So um, it's a complex, difficult environment in the world today. Can we handle it? Uh, yes, provided we pull the country together at home and invest at home. We need to reduce our reliance on Chinese manufacturing, keep our technology at home and invest in it. And we have to change how we think about government. It was the United States government that helped build this country. Uh, that won World War II. It wasn't done by the private sector. It was a government that put together the atomic bomb, the government that demanded the B-29 bomber be built, the government that created this great uh, war machine of democracy that saved the world twice in the 20th century. Government leadership is needed now. We've got to uh, pull our economy together, put people back to work, reach those people who've been alienated and left behind by globalism and deal with challenges that are not coming from other countries, but coming from our world economic development like climate change and pandemics. So it's a, it's a big task um, and um, it, can be, it can be met by the United States um, with the leadership of the United States government. I hope we can pull together. And um, that's what I'm trying to help with Renew America and the civility leadership. With that, Chris, I'd like to stop and take questions and comments. General Clark, thank you so much for that introduction. I, I was particularly happy to get your views there on China, Russia, Iran, immigration, and, and a kind of full range of um, international issues, uh, because I think uh, the audience is interested in both the international perspective of Renew America, America together, but also the domestic side. So before I ask uh, a, a few questions, I'd like to encourage the participants to chat in questions using the chat box. Again, I'll be curating those questions and, uh, and asking uh, the general your questions that you may have for him on any range of issues that are, are about to emerge. Um, but General, if I could just start on, on your, your last points here on the, the kind of situation internationally. We know uh, we, we've had the, the benefit of a number of previous guests, your former colleague, Secretary Chuck Hagel was with us last month. Uh, two weeks ago, we had China expert Tiff Roberts talking on China. So we got a, a good education on what's going on there. You mentioned Russia and then you mentioned some, you know, some transnational issues as well. Um, can I ask you, General, you know, that the world often looks to America for leadership and to unite action on any number of issues. Um, that's been the case um, over many decades. Uh, but uh, the current tenor of our domestic debate is very divisive. And I think that's, uh, of course, what you're talking about in Renew America Together. So General, given the, the divisiveness and, and the kind of um, the, the, the um, polemic inside our, our domestic debate, are we able to lead and unite on international issues of importance like China, like Russia, while we are divided internally? I think we might be able to lead on those issues like China and Russia in terms of a crisis. Um, I don't know, it remains to be seen whether we can use the specter of China to unite on domestic issues. I'm talking about things like a large infrastructure program, wholesale investments in research and development, a, a change in labor laws so that minimum wage is raised and people can get a living wage in this country. Um, because if you can't 
have a living wage, you never take advantage of the talent that's out there. So, you know, we pushed high, we pushed college education so much in this country, especially after the, the 1970s. Got a lot of people who go to college and end up tending bar. I mean, nothing against baristas, uh, they're great. And it's a lot of fun, but it's not a lifetime employment. And, um, and we need to take advantage of people's talents and use them for our future. We don't have quite the system to do that yet in this country. And it's gonna take the two parties working together. And it can't be done. If China were to invade Taiwan, yeah, Democrats and Republicans would both you know, be in outcry. If there's a crisis in Ukraine, yes, there'd be a huge bipartisan outcry. But will we pull together to do what's right for the country? To do that, Chris, we're going to have to reverse 40 years of Republican Ronald Reagan leadership. I voted for Reagan twice. But I didn't understand what the consequences would be. I don't think most of us did. We liked him. He was genial. He was popular. He, you know, he made, he, he talked common sense. And what he said about government was, he said, look, government's like a baby. You put food in at the top. And he said, well, you know what comes out at the bottom. And he said, you know, the 13 most dangerous words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Ronald Reagan said government wasn't so the solution to our problems. It was the problem. Well, maybe we overreacted with the great society in the 1960s and 70s. But today, government is going to have to step forward. And we Americans are going to have to demand that the federal government work for us, not through federalism, not through giving money back to the states, not through what President Bush said, I'm going to give you your money back. No. We want government to give us leadership back, help this country pull together to face the challenges at home and abroad, the inequalities in income, the racism, the disparity, the anguish, the frustration of the long-term unemployed, uh, the challenge of, of white supremacy, as well as the challenges abroad. We need leadership today. Don't know. It's really up to groups like this and the people who are there in Montana to decide. It's a democracy. General, we're getting a lot of questions in, as you might expect, uh, from the participants, but I'd like to squeeze one more in if I could. Um, I, I've really enjoyed watching a number of your events that you've had over the past few years um, with your Renew America Together. And what's interesting is that you often invite guests who may have a differing political view from your own. You had Governor Larry Hogan on. Uh, Governor Hogan said compromise is not a dirty word in, in one of your events. And then Governor Tom Ridge, uh, he said uh, problem solving requires dialogue. But, you know, compromise and dialogue, as much as we like the sound of them, are not always the first tool in the political toolbox that our politicians are reaching for. Finding common ground is difficult, and that ground is when that when common ground is considered the cause of problems. Right? If a politician nowadays compromises, they seem to be weakening their position, right? And and to say nothing about their prospects for re-election. So, in terms of of, of uh, renew America, America together and the civility of debate, where is there room for? compromise so that we can begin talking about and dealing with these issues that, that you've just described? Well, let me take you back to what um, John Adams said very famously, and many of you read this, you know, he said, back during the Revolutionary War or, and afterwards, he said, uh, you know, my colleagues and I study war so that my children can study commerce and industry so that my grandchildren can study arts and literature. Uh, Great, great. In a way that did kind of happen in America. And in the 1970s and 80s, it seemed like we'd done pretty well since World War II. It seemed like there was enough to eat. People had shelter. There was nobody knocking at our door except for Russia was a threat, but it was a long way away. We hadn't, we hadn't fought a war in this country really in a hundred some odd years. Um, there was peace. And so we had the luxury of focusing not on arts and literature, but on values. We could talk about values. There was a moral majority, couldn't stand those people with those beatniks, the people with long hair, smoking dope and stuff like that, and, uh, and, and, and women on the pill. 
and, and what that meant, you know, to marriage. And so that was the 1970s, 1980s start of focusing politics on values. The trouble with focus on values is that values are hard to compromise. Now we've had 40 years of luxury of arguing with each other about values. I want the right to have as many AK-47s and AR-15s as possible. I like a hundred round magazine. Never know who's gonna come knocking on your door at night. And there are people who are against it, just on a matter of principle. And then, you know, there's the issue of a woman's right to choose versus what the, the Pope says is uh, life begins at conception. And so you can argue about this. I once asked a, the Catholic Bishop of Arkansas, I said, you're protecting life, but, um, why aren't you worried about the war in Iraq and Afghanistan? He said, oh, the lives, lives of the unborn are much more important. Well, that's a value choice. And so when Americans divide themselves on the basis of values, it's pretty hard to compromise. Now we're, after 40 years of this, the chickens are coming home to roost. We got China, we got Russia. We've got severe inequalities in this country. Imagine how many, how could four people have more wealth than the bottom half of all Americans? That's where it is in this country. The inequality is staggering. And so we're going to have to ask our government to do things, real things for us. So we can't just talk about values. We've got to talk about interests. Those can be compromised. You don't, want to, you don't want to raise the taxes on corporations to 28% or 29%? Fine. Would you agree with 25%? It's 21% now. Can't we compromise on this? Um, you don't want to have a, a $15 minimum wage? How about a $13.50 minimum wage? Can that be compromised? You don't want to give $1,400 in a fourth wave of payments? Can you give $300? You know, those are issues that are amenable to compromise. Those are the kinds of issues that the American system can best work. So if we do that, maybe we'll break this gridlock. But if we focus on values, it's a long downward spiral for this country. General, here's a question from one of our partners at the Western Montana Military Officers Association. Uh, you mentioned that China's strategy is not focused on freedom, but on prosperity. They cultivate their talent by testing their people and choosing the best. Do you think the Army's new people strategy is our way of trying to catch up? Well, I'm not sure exactly what the Army's new people strategy is. I should know, and every year I get a briefing from the Department of the Army with the retired four stars. But I, if you ask me to describe it, I couldn't describe it. But I, I will tell you this, the way we do our command, we, we went from Vietnam where it was, if you were known, you got a battalion command. Now, if you're up for battalion command, you're evaluated. You're given some psychological tests. They actually, a group of people actually interview. We're trying to avoid toxic leadership. So I think that's an example of how the Army's people strategy can take us forward and can help us. I think that'll be a good system for us. But more broadly, we need to help the American people. Um, we need, I guess we're gonna need preschool for everybody because when you've got working moms and they can't stay home with the kids, you've got to do something with those children other than put them in a playpen. And so uh, we know that early childhood education is a key to later achievement. Can we afford that? Of course, we can afford it if we want to do it. We've got to do more with vocational technical education. Not everybody's going to go to college. But, um, but how do you get a job if you're really good with your hands and really have this instinctive love for machinery? Um, how, how do you get and move into a well-paying job? Maybe that job won't be here 10 years from now. So we need adult training and education and we need to, to systematize it. That's the way we make use of our talent. And by the way, we should welcome immigrants who come to this country because they're a tremendous reservoir of talent. Uh, General, here's one from our audience. I think that you're correct that uh, some in America benefit from the current divisiveness and drive it. Can you elaborate on this point? Well, you know, 
um, what I learned in the private sector in being out of the military is that there's any number of organizations out there that in the, in the, in the not-for-profit space, um, there are organizations like uh, in the environmental space, they have to have an issue. So it could be clean water. If the water was magically cleaned up, those organizations would have to find another issue. There's an organization that's you know really dedicated to preserving the Arctic. The Arctic's our weather industry. These Russian submarines recently surfaced and broke old ice in the Arctic. Ice that's three and four feet thick that's been there for generations. Start breaking that ice up, you'll be out of ice cover in the summer in the Arctic quicker than 2030 or 2035, which is the current forecast. So organizations have causes. So those causes pit one organization against another. But in politics, it's even more um, bizarre. That is to say, you must define issues that separate you from your opponent. You must. And um, the easiest issues are, seem to be the value issues today. So um, in the state of Arkansas, uh, where I live, uh, we're, we're probably like Montana. Majority of the people vote for Donald Trump. But our state legislature has just passed laws um, outlawing abortion, um, outlawing transgender athletics, uh, permitting medical professionals to deny treatment on the basis, to, on any treatment, on the basis of any moral qualms about the patient, um, preventing transgender treatments for those young people who are having um, gender identity issues and, um, and, and so on. So it's a, you know, a, a, a legislature that's really focused on values. They ask, we were gonna get in Arkansas, we were gonna get like an extra $4 billion to do things like electric charging stations and things like this. And the legislature's like, what are we gonna do with $4 billion here? But boy, we need another, you know? So I think over time, these sharp value conflicts will disappear. But right now, that's the way politicians are making their mark. Mm -hmm. General, maybe a, a related to that very last comment is another question from our audience. Um, and, and I'll just preface this by saying uh, a few months ago, we had a series on misinformation, disinformation, and fake news. Much of it's centered around the use of social media. So if any of you uh, would like to see that, you can again check out the YouTube channel. But uh, the question is, how can America reach any social consensus when social media is driving people's beliefs? It's going to be a real challenge. We have to learn how to use the social media. And uh, we have to, you know, we have to first have the right regulations in place. We have to have the right public education in place. And then we're going to have to struggle with those people who've been indoctrinated one way or another. As you know, the algorithms on social media feed you what you're interested in. So if you're interested in girly pictures, I guess you're gonna get a lot of girly pictures. If that's what you're looking at. If you're interested in conspiracy theories, you're gonna get a lot of conspiracy theories. If you're interested in what's happening in Ukraine, they're gonna feed you with all the stories about Ukraine. You're going to be incredibly well informed on what you're interested in, but there's no truth check on it. So if you're looking for UFO stories, um, there's a lot of them out there, and I'm told some of them are true today, but there's probably a lot that aren't. So um, that that's the algorithm. Maybe those algorithms need to change. Maybe these technology companies be, need to be treated like utilities. Maybe the Part of the issue is that, you know, grandmothers like Facebook because they can see pictures of the family. And as uh, soon as they, Facebook came out, I saw grandmothers in airports. Boy, they were showing those pictures back and forth and waiting for airplanes and just having a ball with it. But, but these, um, these social media firms, they make money off knowing what you like. If they were treated as utilities, maybe they wouldn't have to make money that way. Now, that would make some people really unhappy. Um, but on the other hand, it would reduce social media from feeding you to simply being a purveyor and um, channel for, for unbiased information. And 
you know, wouldn't you'd have to sort it yourself. Might be unpleasant. Might find things that you don't necessarily agree with, and uh, it would show up. Might make you unhappy. You know, our real problem, Chris, isn't the social media. It is the fact that that political um, research shows that the brain handles issues differently if they're labeled as Democrat or Republican. If you want to have a discussion about medicine, um, you will process this on the rational side of your brain. But if that same discussion says Democrats or Republicans feel this way about health care, then um, it gets processed on the other side of your brain. It triggers emotions. So, um, so we've got a lot to learn on social media. One thing that may provide a source of comfort, if you go back and look historically, every time there's been a quantum step forward in media, there's been a period of instability associated with it. And that was true with the yellow press. We went to war against Spain and, and went and invaded Cuba and conquered the Philippines in part because of the yellow press. It was partisan, it was pumped out, it filled people's uh, minds with a certain vision and boom, we acted. There was radio, there was television. Television drove us out of Vietnam. If you hadn't seen those pictures on television, it would have been like World War II. You said, boy, the boys are doing great over there and uh, I hope they all come home and gee, some of them don't make it, And uh, but we're fighting for our country. Once television brought those pictures into the living room, America said, this war is a mistake. This was 1968, 69 with Walter Cronkite turning against it. And, um, and, and that was the end of public support for the war in Vietnam. It was a function of television. So now you have social media. How do we deal with it? Here's the way we dealt with the television in the military. We learned our lesson in Vietnam. We said the number one criteria for success is don't lose people. And the number two criteria is don't hurt civilians. When I was camp commanding the operation in uh, Kosovo in 1999, my number one priority was don't lose aircraft. My number two priority is don't hurt innocent civilians. And um, we, we did pretty well with it. As long as you, know, you were capable of articulating the priorities. The British said, oh no, let's fly the airplanes lower and let's really strike those tank tanks and stuff. No, no, you do that, you're gonna get aircraft shot down. So, you know, you have to learn the lessons of what the media teaches you. We have to learn the lessons of social media for our politics. <laughs> Those are tough lessons to learn. And as you say, sometimes they, they make us uncomfortable and unhappy, <laughs> I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I wanted to pick up on something you just said there, General, um, uh, because I, I watched a, a recent uh, event of yours at the Philadelphia World Affairs Council. And you said something there that I think really resonates with a lot of people and, and our concern that particularly in the social media environment, um, we... And by we, I mean anybody of any uh, political persuasion or of any opinion, we try to impose a kind of superior logic or superior facts in a political debate. But you said something very interesting. You said politics is mostly what is in the heart and not what is in the head. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about what you meant by that. Well, what I learned is in running for office is that if you want people to vote for you, you've got to they've got to like you and love you. It's not just about who's the brainiest guy up there. And, and one of the things that, dis, that, that distinguishes the two parties is, I think the Republican party does a better job on the whole of appealing to the heart. It talks about values, family values, human values, and other things, um, patriotism. The Democratic party has traditionally been more about policies. So when Democratic candidates run for office, they're asked by members of the media, what's your, what's your plan for health care in America? And so they roll out a six page, 50 point health care plan that's been checked by six different health care professionals. This is what I did when I ran for office. And then, you know, the, the, the media says, 
Uh, wait a minute. On your third paragraph down, the second uh, bow leg on, you said there were 64%, and uh, the figures I show show there are only 46%. Are you sure you're, you know, and then that you get into these dumb facts and policy debates that the public can't follow. Politics is mostly about who do you trust with the public power of leadership? Who has integrity? Who has no conflicts of interest? Who is there for selfless service rather than selfish service? Now, I, I will tell you that uh, being in politics is not like being a monk. So you wouldn't be in politics if you didn't have a healthy ego. And if you don't have a really healthy ego, you can't stay in politics because you're gonna get the, you know what beat out of you because that's the nature of the system. That's what we believe is the genius of our system. Now Xi Jinping in China, he doesn't like that. You criticize Xi Jinping, you're going off to re-education camp if you're lucky or something else if you're not. And um, in this country, we criticize constantly. Joe Biden was hardly in office between before people are saying, hey, are you gonna run for a second term? In other words, you know, the subtext is, hey, you're like an old man. Uh, don't we need somebody, you know, more vigorous than you? It was direct criticism. And, um, and of course, in an American politics, you gotta be able to take it. But it is about the heart. It's about trust because the public can never second guess all the facts, all the circumstances that go into decisions. You just can't. Today, I was on the phone with, um, with some people who were putting in an anti-corruption program in the Dominican Republic. And I was told that the last administration actually went to this government and the administration and said, this anti-corruption anti program is a good thing, but uh, you don't have to worry about the American products coming in uh, because they're not corrupt. Really? Okay. I mean, that's our government influenced by some domestic provider of beer or alcohol or cigarettes or something, going to our State Department, telling the State Department to go to a foreign government and telling them not to apply anti-corruption. I was disappointed when I heard it, but that's what happens. So um, you want people in office that aren't susceptible to those kinds of blandishments and threats. People who have integrity, who when they say they're gonna drain the swamp, they drain the swamp. Thanks for that, General. I have another question moving back into the kind of international sphere, if you will. Um, this reads, when you served as Supreme Allied Commander Europe, you worked very hard to strengthen NATO command and control. What is your current assessment of the Alliance and the more aggressive pressure from Russia? Well, I think the alliance is, um, is fundamentally structured okay. Um, I'm happy we've got the, the new members of the alliance. When I was at NATO, they came to me uh, like they came to President Clinton and Secretary Albright and others and asked these countries in the Baltics and the Balkans, they said, you've got to let us into NATO because they said, today Russia's weak, but soon it'll be strong again. And we'll only have protection if we're in NATO. So I'm glad we brought them in. It makes the decision making a little more complicated. I think we've got great military leadership today. Um, but um, I do worry that the, that the challenge is more complicated today. During the Cold War, um, there was an Iron Curtain. And it, it was harder for the Russians to get spies into Germany. There wasn't a lot of Russian money invested in Germany. And insofar as the Germans and others bought Russian gas, they were very conscious of the fact that it came from an adversary. There's no Cold War today. Um, Russian money's all over Europe. It buys influence everywhere. Um, the Nord Stream two pipeline is going to feed Russian natural gas into Germany. Germany's always had a sort of strange relationship with the rest of Europe. 
Germany is a export oriented economy. It needs markets and it needs energy. Its natural partner is Russia. And Russia needs to sell its resources and it needs German technology. And so um, that's a partnership economically that's deadly from a security perspective because it's what Lenin said, <laughs> Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, 1924, like, new economic program in the Soviet Union. They were taking in investments from, of all places, uh, Western Europe. And as Lenin said, the capitalists will sell us the rope with which we can hang them. And yeah, I mean, that's, and that's Germany's instinct. And so the old joke about NATO was, the purpose of NATO was keep Russia out, America in, and Germany down. And so as Germany has built back up and dominates the European Union, it makes it more difficult to coordinate policies with respect to Russia. I was very glad that Ukraine President Zelensky went to Paris uh, and he's talked to Angela Merkel. And I think there's strong support for Ukraine in the face of this Russian buildup. But it's a fault line and a vulnerability or an attack surface, if you want to put it that way, in hybrid warfare terms, that wasn't there during the Cold War to the same extent. Uh, General, I'll just pick up on that last one. And, and I, I have a few questions that I'll kind of wrap up into one. Um, since we're talking about China and Russia, I mean, recently, um, China and Russia have been more explicitly uh, noted as strategic threats to the United States. It's always been a, a bit more implicit and, and subtle. It's always been there yet. Somehow in the past weeks, um, that's become more explicit, including um, uh, President Biden's call to um, remove our troops from Afghanistan by September 11th in order to refocus um, American attention. So what are your views here, General, in, in terms of China and Russia and these, these kinds of threats? Are these things to be neutralized? Are, are, is there a place for a compromise in, in, terms of a, in, in terms of global order? How should America view and then deal with the threats being posed by major powers? Well, I think um, you can understand the position of these two powers if you just look at the record of US behavior over the last 20 years. When we were struck by Osama bin Laden, we were angry. Okay, we went to Afghanistan, but we didn't need to invade Iraq. We did it without paying attention to what our allies told us. The UN team said he has no nuclear weapons. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice said, well, there might be a mushroom cloud. Uh, there was a lot of scare talk. 80% of the American people wanted to invade Iraq. It was like something out of Roman history, you know, Cartagena de Linda Est, Carthage must be destroyed, you know, and um, that's what the Roman Senate said, and uh, they destroyed Carthage. But um, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't succeed in making Iraq a democracy. They're not appealing to be the 51st state. What we did is we created a real problem. We then went after Gaddafi in Libya without a UN Security Council resolution. Turns out that French President Macron, not sorry, not, not, not Macron, Sarkozy, who was the French president at the time, had taken Libyan money in his reelection, in his election campaign in France. This is a huge case in France you never read about in the United States. He's in, on trial for corruption. Do you think the fact that Gaddafi was trying to hold him hostage. So I gave you money for election. And Sarkozy said, you're not going to hold me hostage. We're going to bomb you. I think that might have been something behind why we went to Libya. And yet, you know, Russia and China say, you know, you're the major force disrupting world affairs. Well, we're not angels. We're not perfect. We did a great job during the Cold War. I'm really happy we stopped the slaughter in Bosnia and prevented ethnic cleansing in Kosovo. Iraq was a mistake. Getting rid of Gaddafi the way we did, leaving chaos in Libya has been a mistake. Um, we didn't help Europe deal with the refugee crisis coming out of Syria. That was a mistake. 
So we're not perfect. We have to accept that. We've made our share of mistakes. So um, we have to get our own house in order. And somehow we have to live with China and Russia. We have to protect our values. We have to ally ourselves with others who share these values. But we have to respect China for who they are, for their history, for their accomplishments. And look, I'm not sure you want a democracy in China. If you, if you had a Chinese democracy, they might really become nationalistic. They might say, who are these people across the Pacific who have you know, taken our workers in the 19th century and mistreated them and are biased against Asians? We should teach these Americans something. Uh, it might cause more problems. Let China be China. We want to be the best America we can be for the benefit of our own people and help those who share our values. We do that we can weather this challenge without war and we can live with people whose systems we disagree with. General, I'm gonna squeeze in one more question if I could. And then I just like to tell the audience that your colleague, Mary Lee Smith has asked if she could say a few words on the Renew America Together leadership initiative. Uh, and, and so um, maybe after this question, we'll ask Mary Lee to join us. But um, this comes from another audience member. Um, through Renew America Together, you've had the opportunity to speak with university students across America on different campuses. Um, what are you hearing from this generation uh, of Americans? How do they see the situation? And does your message resonate with them? I think it resonates very strongly. They see an America that has to change. They see an America that hasn't really um, lived up to its values. We don't take care of everybody. We don't do what the Statue of Liberty said, bring me your poor, you know, struggling masses. We're not dealing successfully with the immigration issue. We're not dealing successfully with the uh, income inequality. In fact, by OECD standards, we're ranked as the least mobile least opportunity capable developed country in the world. If you're born in the bottom 40% of income in this country, your odds of reaching the top 20% are lower than in almost any other developed country. So uh, we've got a lot to do to live up to our values. I think the younger generation knows that. I think they're determined. And, you know, I looked at these demonstrations that after um, uh, the tragedy in, in Minneapolis this past summer. And I will tell you that when I came back from Oxford in 1968, and I looked at what was happening at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, I was shocked. I was horrified. The raw violence of that era was terrible. It was brought about by the Vietnam War, by fear of the draft, by, um, by um, the unleashing of racism, and it was ugly. I looked at those young people who were marching in Washington, DC, and across America, and you know what? <laughs> they were diverse. They were representative of America. They were all ethnic groups all colors. There were African-Americans, there were whites, there were Asians, there were Hispanics in those crowds. Uh, they were united in their, and they were, they're mostly young people, and they were united in their um, belief that America has to do a better job of living up to our values. That's what I'm hearing, and, um, and I agree with them. General, I, I apologize. I made a little mistake here. It's uh, uh, I, I wanted to ask you, um, maybe not your colleague, regarding well, the Renew America to Together. Come on. Well, she's welcome to come on. I just want to say that I, I also received uh, a message about the leadership initiative, which is, which is quite an extraordinary opportunity, uh, really aligned with the mission of Renew America Together. I wonder if you could say a few words about that. Let our audience know, you know, what is this initiative and how can they take part if they would like to? Well, you can come online and read all about it, but essentially it's um, uh, a series of uh, Fridays in the, at one, one a month 
that on Friday afternoon, Friday from nine to, to four, um, you meet with people uh, online, <clears throat> on Zoom, who don't necessarily share your beliefs. And you learn how to communicate across the aisle. And it's for people of all backgrounds, all ages. We're gonna ask you to write an essay as to why you wanna be there. Um, and there's a, we're gonna pay for some of it. We're gonna ask you to pay for some of it. And we're gonna give you a certificate when you finish that's um, a very valuable um, piece of evidence that you've learned something about communicating. I'd like to introduce Mary Lee Smith. I see her on the screen with you. This is her brainchild. She's a University of Arkansas graduate, um, former uh, Pi Phi sorority. She's worked with me and in the healthcare business in Arkansas for um, over 15 years. And she's a real spark plug in this. So Mary Lee, talk a little about what you put together and why you think it's good for America. Sure, thanks General Clark. And thanks um, to the Montana World Affairs Council for having us. So the Renew America Together Civility Leadership Institute is going to be a six month professional development program that is going to be application based. We're encouraging people from all different fields um, in the country to apply everyone from educators, elected officials, mayors, grassroots, party activists, even college students, anyone that thinks that they could use these skills to learn how to have crucial conversations and communicate with better with people. If you think these skills will benefit for you, we'd love to hear why you think you should be part of our inaugural class. So participants will meet once a month for six months, starting in July, ending in December, and they are going to receive training and professional certifications in Vital Smarts Crucial Conversations and type coach influence training. These are two professional certificates that um, we didn't make up. This has been a curriculum around for a while, but we've taken our own spin on it and are going to have some really great speakers from around the country um, that are going to be joining us. We have um, Frank Luntz, a um, a pollster that's going to be joining us, um, a consultant to um, lots of different candidates in the past. We have Anthony Scaramucci is going to be joining us as a speaker. Um, Congressman um, Bob Inglis is going to be joining us to talk about the environment. We have some executives from Yelp going to be talking about big tech. So we're really going to be covering lots of subjects that are going to be interesting to everyone. And we're going to create a community where people and participants will get to know each other. We're going to have no more than 40 participants. So we're really going to create a community where people will learn and create relationships with people that they otherwise would never have an opportunity to know. And they're going to get to know General Clark too. So that's really exciting. So if anybody has any, would like information, have people that you would like to apply, um, you can contact us. My email address, um, Julie can put it in the chat. It's Mary Lee at renewamericatogether.org. And we also have um, a really great webpage with our schedule, the requirements, what's involved, what we're asking of people. Um, and you can visit that at renewamericatogether.org forward slash CLI. Thank you. Well, Mary, that is quite an extraordinary opportunity. I just want uh, you to know that you'll be seeing my application certainly uh, on that one. And to let you know that my colleague, Julie, has um, put the web link into the chat box. So anybody who's interested either on more information or I would strongly encourage you to apply because um, the way that General Clark and Mary Lee have described this kind of training, you know, it's extremely timely for all of us who care about what's going on in America and trying to find ways in which we can bridge this divide, this divisiveness that we're seeing in our, our political debate and in our social debate. So uh, thank you very much for, for bringing that to our attention. And, and uh, I told Mary Lee earlier that we would um, add this to our own social media and that I've been emailing this out and we'll send this out to our members as well. Um, so so um, now in closing, I would just like to, first of all, um, give sincere thanks to you, General Clark. Um, not only um, have you had a lifetime of service to this country and its people, but when, when you as a, as a public servant continue this service and, and continue your work with organizations like Renew America Together, we really all benefit. And so I, I can't thank you enough, not only for coming on, but for all of the work that you do. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Chris. It's great to be with you and your audience. Uh, tonight. And uh, 
I hope you'll take us up on uh, visiting the webpage and applying to the Civility Leadership Institute. Well, uh, you can be sure that I will and many of us will. And, and um, if you weren't here for the pregame chatter, I did invite General Clark to Montana also to come out and visit us sometime. So that invitation is also open to hike and, and fish and um, uh, meet all of us out here. So um, you can just keep that uh, in the back of your mind. Um, I just want to remind our participants that next up on Connect Montana is Tuesday, May 11th. So we have a, a week off. But at noon, we're welcoming Mr. Akluk Lang. Mr. Lang was appointed as an expert member of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and chaired the Inuit Circumpolar Council. That's going to be a really interesting um, discussion on Indigenous issues. Please drop me a line at info at montanaworldaffairs.org with any feedback or any kinds of topics that you would like to see on Connect Montana. So uh, until then, I want to thank you again, General Clark, Mary Lee, and to all of our participants tonight. Thank you so much. Be well and see you soon. Bye-bye.